Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, right now, we have a keynote, a uh, second keynote of the day by Seth Dobrin, and he's going to talk to us about uh, responsible AI uh, and why companies that prioritize responsible implementation of AI have better business outcomes than those that don't, even among AI leaders. Uh, why is it that more organizations aren't prioritizing responsible AI? And uh, the answer actually might be that there is a knowledge gap between, uh, as well as confusing matrix of, of tools, standards, and pending regulations and frameworks. Uh, more on this by our keynote, Seth Obrin. Seth, please join us on stage. All right, thank you. Oh, whoops, there it is. Almost lost all my notes. <laughs> Well, hi everyone, I'm Seth Dobrin. I am, uh, as of today, officially the president of the Responsible AI Institute, which if you haven't heard of it, is a nonprofit focused on helping organizations uh, implement and uh, uh, operationalize responsible AI. Uh, we've had some good talks this morning. I think most of them have been uh, technical. Uh, mine's not gonna be technical, but it's gonna talk about how as technicians, or technical folks, you can actually implement responsible AI in a scalable, seamless manner that doesn't interf interfere with your workflow too much, hope hopefully. And so, as we look at what responsible AI is and how you implement it, the EU actually put it perfectly, right? It says it right up here. AI is, should work for the people and be the, of the good of the people and not against them. And when we think about, you know, what AI for good looks like, we have to remember that trust is essential for us as human beings. As human beings, all of our interactions rely on trust. And it encapsulates the one aspect or an important aspect of humanity and how we operate as a society. And when we look at trust and responsibility, these are both as aspects of both our online and our offline life. And again, they're critical for how we operate as a society. And if we don't have these trust and responsibility, operations will come to a grinding halt. And when we look at technology, it advances at incredible paces. And it's been going this fast for a really long time. And one of the things behind the forces of innovation has been artificial intelligence. And I would argue, or maybe it's not much of an argue, that AI is going to continue to drive and accelerate this innovation. But AI hasn't had an easy ride. If we look at what's been going on in the, work, in the world today, we see that there's issues from a lack of trust in design, uh, from a lack of uh, ethical issues that have scared and or scarred the image of AI, and have really put a, micro, a microscope on what we do as an industry. But even if we look at the, even in the, in the context of this, we're noticing that 77% of organizations are actively exploring or implementing the use of AI in their business. And if we look at what's on the top of mind, two years ago, or last year, I guess still, PwC found that 57% of these 77% of the organizations have plans to ensure that their AI is aligned with the, uh, the upcoming or inevitable regulations that are occurring. And thankfully, or surprisingly, there's still 1% of organizations, or only 1% of organizations, that have no plans to address AI responsibility issues. And when we look at what's been going on, when we look at the steps to ensure the responsible and AI, uh, trustworthy AI implementation, we're seeing that organizations are focused on really three things. One is they want, 74% of them want to show that they have actions or want to actually operationalize reduced bias. So how do I reduce bias in my AI? Oops, gotta go back, sorry. Second, 68% of them are tracking performance variations and model drift, and 61% of them are ensuring that we make good and adequate explanations. And furthermore, when we look at a McKinsey study from, la from last year, organizations that are seeing the highest return on their AI practices are actually integrating risk mitigation practices as part of this. 
I think this displays a myth that often, often exists, especially in those of us that are or were practicing data scientists, that having these things in place slow us down and prevent innovation. They actually help to increase innovation. In fact, if you look at the AI leaders, so a group of leaders that MIT and BCG have identified as leaders in the space, what we're finding is that they're claiming to develop better products, they're claiming their brand reputation is increased, and they have higher levels of innovation. This is not surprising to me, but oftentimes it's surprising uh, when we look at what's going on in the world or what people who are actually doing the work think. Now, we're entering a new era of AI, and ethical oversight continues to reduce risk and drive AI transparency. This is bringing in a new era of AI where one of trustworthiness and responsibility are forefront in it. And when we think about what's required for this, it requires rigorous training and testing of data because data is a key factor in how we build and deploy responsible AI. When we also look into this, responsible AI will further to help drive the implementation and adoption of AI systems. But to do this right, it all starts with a human-centric design. And the only way that we can have a human and response, human-centric and responsible approach to AI is to put humans at the center and make sure we have a good collaboration between humans and AI and to make sure that the development and monitoring of these AI systems are done in this context. Now, the human species has driven, tech, has driven innovation and technolo technological advancements for millennium. From the Paleolithic stone tools all the way through to present day emerging technologies such as AI, humans have placed technologies as central part of our lives. And sometimes it makes our lives better, and sometimes not so much. We need to remember that AI is a tool and it's developed to add, an, add intelligence to how we operationalize tasks. But however, human behavior is very often left out of this formula and it requires a careful balance to do it right. As such, technological design has often been at odds with the needs of an individual or a group. This is an acute issue in technologies driven by artificial intelligence and results in suboptimal execution at best without design at the forefront. And we need to make sure this human machine collaboration, uh, whoops, we need to make sure that this human machine collaboration continues to drive forward. Now, how do we humanize AI? This is uh, Refik Anadol, he's a digital and media artist. And he's focused on leveraging AI to create art. And he recently did an exhibit at the MoMA, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, where he took the metadata from their entire collection. And he created new art from artists that were similar in nature. So it was a collection of artists. And these are three of the pieces that I bought the NFTs for. And I don't know about you, but to me, these really touched the, the soul of humans. And to do this, he had to put humans at the center of his design of his art. Now, AI has come under the watch of organizations across the globe. And untrustworthy potential of AI has been heavily criticized in the past. And we've seen it go wrong in a few places. In fact, there's an example from, uh, from last year where LGBTQ couples were denied mortgages at, an in, in, at a higher rate than their heterosexual peers. Or we all know of examples where there's been discrimination in job applications. So good intentions where AI was put in place to help minimize bias from gender and racial bias in the US, um, it's actually created and expanded on this bias because as you all know, as well as I do, AI itself is just math. And math is not inherently biased. The bias that the AI picks up when we talk about biased AI is from the data, from the past decisions that we as humans have made. And the examples of the discrimination and the mortgages, 
These are all ingrained in previous decisions that we've made, or in the case of the hiring specifically, where there were very few female applicants historically that have been put forward. So how did we expect the AI to really progress without being biased? When we look at bias in healthcare, bias in healthcare is a huge problem from socioeconomical differences where we see people who are from lower economic backgrounds and lower economic means who don't seek health care as often as others, especially in parts in the U.S., I think, where it's the only place that, that there's no uh, really government-mandated or government-associated health care, um, to racial biases because people of certain ethnicities or races don't seek health care as often as others because of things that have been done to harm them in the past. This is an issue that we really need to overcome. Now, when we think of pervasive uh, examples of algorithmic racism and, and sexism in the, in the AI, Johns Hopkins University has found uh, huge instances of this in the past. And they're continuing to report on these and expand them further. And there's been a call to justice that's been issued on the robotics of AI and AI ethics communities to collaborate on mitigating these racial biased and racial and sexist bias that exists in, in the data that the AI is being trained on. If you want to see more examples of this, uh, you can go to the Responsible AI Institute website and you can see our, our map that we have of instances that have occurred all over the place, all over the world in the past five years. Now, as we think about what's happening moving forward, governance and regulations for responsible AI is ever increasing. And when we look at what this is implemented like in, 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 in practice, we're seeing regulations that already exist in Canada. We're seeing regulations that are coming up in the UK. All of us know about the EU AI Act. There's even regulations in China and most surprisingly, there's actually regulations to prevent this or cover this in the US. Now, regulation is an important part of what we do. And as I said earlier, I think it's an important piece of the trusting and, and being developing responsible AI story. Because we need regulation, obvi because obviously companies are not doing this well on their own. And as practitioners, I think it helps to guide us, provide guardrails for what we can and can't do to execute and implement effective AI and so that our projects don't get derailed later on or shut down altogether or cause our companies to have ridiculous fines, such as the proposed 6% of total turnover in the EU. That's, all, that's even bigger than GDPR. Now, the business, the business of trustworthy AI actually drives new value. And when we think about the obvious commercial benefits of using AI, we often fail to create systems that truly empower and augment humans. Now, over the years, I've developed a formula for implementing responsible AI in organizations. So I've actually done this for two Fortune 500 companies over the last 10 years. And in my, former, in my position as the former chief AI officer at IBM, I've helped hundreds of companies around the world implement and execute on responsible AI programs. Now, if we think about an analogy, let's go to the film industry. Pixar is arguably one of the world's best film storytellers. They've had 16 Academy Awards and numerous other awards for their work. Pixar does this by developing a formula. And they do this formula. This formula looks something like this. Once upon a time, there was. Every day, there was. One day, because of that, and because of that, until finally. So what this looks like in practice. Once upon a time, there was a fish, Marlin, and his son, Nemo. Every day, Marlin warns Nemo about the dangers of the ocean. And like any adolescent, Nemo ignores his father one day. And because of that, Nemo ends up in a fish tank. And because of that, Marlin sets off on a journey to find Nemo. Until finally, Marlin finds Nemo and brings him home safely. And as you know, this is all from Finding Nemo, the Pixar movie, and it won an Academy Award as well. And this is this formula they use over and over again. If you examine every picture from Pixar, it follows this formula. 
Now, as I've mentioned, over the years, I've developed a formula for implementing responsible AI in the workplace. And this is my formula. Number one, ensure that you develop explainable AI and that the AI systems are interpretable. And that word systems that I add on is important because if we examine individual AI models, they may themselves be explainable and they may themselves not contain any bias. When you combine them into something that actually solves a business problem, because as we all know, one model probably does not solve the problem. It's probably multiple models put in together. And they also surface in an application, a workflow, and a process. AI systems is a key factor. We need to measure bias and the fairness of the AI systems. We need to validate the operations of the AI system. So what environment do they work in? We need to augment robustness, safety, and security. This is going to be even more important when the EU Act comes into place for any high-risk uh, use case, use of AI. We need to have, make sure we have accountability for the implementation of these AI systems. Who is the one person in your organization who is accountable for all the AI systems when something goes wrong? Probably most of your organization, there is no one person. And we need to make sure there's consumer protections that are in place to help protect our customers, especially if we operate in a B2B business. Now, Pixar, when they developed their formula, they did this not on a whim. They did this by examining what mistakes organizations have made in the past when they were building films. And so I've experienced a few things a few, through my travels and interactions with lots of companies. Many companies have AI programs where they have no strategic planning in place. The business value is unmapped. So the true value of AI is not how many models I have, not how many users I have on my model. It is the value that it drives to the companies that we operate in. And by value, it's got to be reduced to dollars and cents. How much money is it making me? And how much money is it saving me? I think the only non-true value metric that is important for an AI system is how is it making the humans lives that interact with this, my customers, my employees, better, cheaper, or faster through NPS. Design is often an afterthought and trust is an afterthought. And then finally, there is no human centric approach, which is actually the driver for these previous four mistakes. Now, when we look about a look at how we harmonize AI development and design, there's four things that we need to consider. I like lists in case you couldn't tell. Number one, you need education. Number two, you need a way to audit, whether it's internal audits or someone externally coming in and doing your audit. Number three, you need to understand the maturity of your organization. What types of processes, governance, and controls do we have in place in our organizations to make sure that AI is implemented in a way that's aligned with the customer ethos, as well as any potential regulations for a given AI? And finally, we need to make sure there's harmonization of regulations and standards around the globe. Fortunately, from a standards perspective, we've gotten agreements from the biggest standard bodies in the world that any AI standards that are built from like ISO, UCAS, Standard Council of Canada, and others are going to be harmonized. So they're all going to be fairly consistent in how they're executed. Now, when we look at it, you know, inclusion and diversity are buzzwords for the century. And the only way to ensure we have both of these things in our AI is to make sure we start with the humans. Who is the human that's going to be impacting the AI that we build? Who's the input human that's going to be using it? Oftentimes, they're not the same person. Why is this AI being used in the first place? So what problem is it trying to solve? And how is it going to be implemented? Those are all important questions that we often forget to ask until, the after, until afterwards. And you can't have diversity inclusion if you don't understand who the AI is going to impact up front. Now, as you all know, again, we have a choice. And it's really this binary choice. AI can help us make the world a better place, or it can continue to propagate and advance all the poor decisions that as a human race we've made in the past. And so just real quick to recap the formula, 
This is a way to make sure that your AI is implemented in a responsible, trustworthy, and fair manner. I encourage you to think about these things as you're building and deploying and designing AI systems. And if you're interested in learning more about any of these things, I encourage you to become a member of the Responsible AI Institute. Just an individual member or your organization can become an organizational member. But follow the link or the QR code and sign up to become an individual manner, a member. And with that, I thank you for your time. Hi, Seth. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask if there are any potential questions for Seth. I'm not sure. I can't see. Uh, any questions? No? Uh, well, then, uh, thank you very much for your time and for your talk. Uh, I hope uh, you'll have fun uh, with us in the rest of our conference. And if you think of any questions, feel free to catch Seth, Dr. Seth in the hallway. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.